morning everybody. Uh, my topic for today is uh, going to be on human population and the slide that I am going to bring in is that human population is a depleting resource. Right? Contrary to popular belief, I am going to bring in a different angle that it is a depleting resource rather than us being an overpopulated planet. Right? Uh, since 280, we have had uh, scare mongers tell us that uh, we are a burdensome resource on this planet. So in 180, we had a Christian philosopher, Tertullian, who said this, we are burdensome to the world, the resources are scarcely adequate for us. Already nature does not sustain us. This he said at a time where the world's population was 180 million. Right? Currently, if you look at the United States, on the eastern side, we have over 186 million people living fairly well. So, this prediction of Turtle did not come true. Then, we had a Christian philosopher again, an English cleric, and a very, uh, a big expert in political economics, as well as demographics, uh, Robert Thomas Malthus, who predicted with the Malthusian catastrophe. So, he said that if our population keeps growing, we will be faced with famine, epidemics, pestilence and plagues that will sweep off tens and thousands of people. Uh, when he made this prediction, the world's population was 980 million. Right? Uh, in 1978, uh, we had a Stanford professor called Paul Erkin, who and he and his wife and predicted in their book, The Population Bomb, uh, that the entire population would cease to exist in 10 years. Yeah. So his book had a quote which said, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the next 10 years, hundreds of millions of people will starve in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. As per the UN in October 2011, as per their latest statistics, we are 6.7 million. And far away from millions of starvation or dying of starvation. Though we do have issues of starvation in a few nations, we do have issues of malnutrition, but this prediction did not hold true. Right? Uh, so now let's look at some of the trends in population. As a mass of population, we are definitely increasing. But the rate of increase of population is declining, right? Uh, we have we have made a personal choice as a race to have fewer children. Uh, it's not an accident; it's by choice. Most of us are having lesser children, and population is currently declining in a lot of nations, which could probably pose a huge problem for us in the near future. Now, if you look at the total fertility rate in the world currently, if you see all these blues, that is about 1 to 2, the fertility rate of 1 to 2. So, if you look at the nation which is, the nations in the African region and the Indian region are at least above uh, <coughs> the standard that the UN talks about. So, in developed nations, we talk about a standard fertility rate of 2.1, and in developing nations, the standard fertility rate is 2.5. So if you look at this map, most countries are either maintaining the standard or they are below the standard, thus probably having a huge population crisis not very far from us. Right? Uh, what the developed nations currently are facing is something called as the demographic economic paradox, whereby people are getting educated, uh, people, there is a lower mortality rate, less birth rate, because people are getting educated, life is becoming expensive, and women are getting educated, so thereby they are getting married later, they are also entering the workforce, so people are planning families as well. Whereas it's different in the developing countries like in Africa and Asia, where people look as a, a new baby as an added being of subsistence, and also look at a baby or an additional baby in terms of a caregiver later in their lives. Education level very low, women not working, there is absolutely 
no idea about contraception in most of these countries. So people are consistently procreating. Whereas in the, in the developed countries, people cease to procreate. Now if you look at this, we have seen a, a dash which, show, which predicts uh, or shows what has been the total fertility rate right from 1950 and predicted till 2019. Right? In, 19, in the period of 1950 to 55, the total fertility rate on this planet was 4.9. As of two, in the period of 2010 to 2015, it's dropped down to 2.36. And if you look at what happens in 2019, this entire thing becomes less than 1.5. So, this slide tells us that we are declining in terms of total fertility rate at a very fast pace. Yeah. Uh, let's look at the fertility rates in India as of 2012. Uh, if you look at all these blues, we are talking about the lighter blues are 1.8 to 2 and the darker blues, so the states of Tamil Nadu, West Bengal and the northern states of Haryana, Punjab, it is less than 1.5. Yeah. Now if you look at Indian statistics, there are more than just a decision to not procreate, but there is a huge trend of female feticide happening and with the female, the population of female dropping the fertility rate comes down further. Though India has a prenatal sex determination ban, a lot of it happens in the northern states, which is why the population of females is declining, especially in the northern states. And if you see, it's the Pimaru states that are actually appropriated. So what is the real crisis that we are going to see in the near future? Uh, not having enough people could be the worst crisis or the biggest crisis that this planet is ever going to face. Yeah? Lower population has come because of probably certain historic events like the Great Depression, the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the Great Recession. These were certain triggers but it was a choice by human beings to not procreate except for immediately after the World War II where we had the entire boomer generation whereby people after years of war and depression thought that this was the only way of having some happiness in their lives and that's why we had the boomer generation and then when the Gen X and the Gen Y came in again we saw a steep fall in fertility rates. Declining population obviously impacts economics so there is a lower demand for products and services and that is co-plundered uh, or co-enhanced uh, yeah. by a shortage of, absolute shortage of labor. The pressure that comes on the younger generation is immense because your younger generation has to feed for a hell lot of older generation or retirees. So if you look at, I am going to showcase a few countries where this issue has become extremely grave. So if you look at Japan, currently their decline is by 25%. Their actual population, absolute numbers is declining. In 2005, they had 128 million. It's expected to drop to 95 million in 2015. By 2055, 38% of their population is going to be over the age of 65. Now, if the country wants to correct this situation, there are two options to them. Either they increase their retirement age to 77, or they will need 17 million migrants to move to Japan by 2050. Yeah. This, the, another immediate uh, issue that Japan is facing is caring for the elderly. <coughs> because they have a huge number of people in the elderly sector with younger people not having time to look after them because they need to sustain the older generation as well as themselves. Then we have Europe, which is an aging, aging continent. The median age currently there is 52.3, when compared to India where it is 26.7. More than one-fifth of their population is above 65 and they have a huge number in the 85 plus as well. Right? They will need to add 50 million more people by 2016 to sustain Europe. They have large scale 
uh, labor shortages which has resulted in an absolute reduced industrial output. China. China has had a growth rate of 0.47 which is one of the lowest in the world. They ranked 159 in terms of their growth rates. Their one side policy has limited their population drastically because of which they have had gender imbalances, they have had demographic imbalances and the shrinking workforce. Only one side, they were three decades now, they had one side actually providing for two parents and four, four grandparents, that's two sets of grandparents. So economically it's becoming a huge challenge for the younger generation. October 29th, the Communist Party uh, did away with their three decade long uh, one child policy. The Chinese media is saying that this would bring in another 17, 75 billion in terms of consumption in the long term. Today's newspaper says that uh, in an opinion poll done by Sina News that 43% of China doesn't want to have a second child. 29% are saying we may probably think and 28% says not sure, we'll wait and watch how it pans out. So the mentality of the people in China is to stay away from more kids because twofold. One is China is expensive to live. And secondly, people do not know what a second child is. For three, three generations now, they have only seen one kid in every family. So they are not too sure what the dynamics are if you have another kid in the family. So what would be the long term impact in the near future? We would have a shortfall of workers in the developed world and probably a surplus in the developing world. So places like India and Africa. Economies will have to start fighting for manpower. We will be competing for manpower. Gone are the days where we will be fighting for natural resources or probably still for land because we will get manpower along the land. But the main battle will be for will be we will be vying for manpower because lower manpower results in low production, low production results in low output and a poor balance of payments. Accepting and migrants probably could be the way ahead for a lot of these nations. But getting migrants in, uh, getting migrants in could have its own set of issues which we'll look at a little later. Now, so does Germany know about this? Has Germany figured out all this? Have they realized this? Probably yes. This is why they are so accepting of the migrants. Currently, Germany has eight a shortage of eight lakh resources in the wind industry. That is in mathematics, information technology, natural sciences, and technology. As we speak today, there are 8 lakh jobs available only in this sector in Germany. Their population growth is shrinking. It's 81, it was 81.3 million in 2013. It is now going to fall to 17.8 million in 2016. The Institute of Economic Research in Cologne, IW, urged the government in September 15th to accept more migrants, create uh, systems to integrate uh, these uh, migrants as well as set up courses so that people can under read, understand and speak the German language. So what is the impact that a migrant could have economically? Increase in social spending. Uh, now, the EU has created an emergency aid of 6.2 billion dollars to provide for education, housing and social needs of the migrants of which 600 million is given to Italy because they have an adverse balance of payments and 433 million is given to Greece so that they can handle with the, the migrants coming in. Germany has allocated 9.6 billion dollars to look after the migrant population. Altered labor markets. So when you see migrants coming in, there could be three scenarios in your labor market. One is skilled labor from the migrant population will compete with the skilled labor in the home nation or the host nation, thereby probably creating a temporary unemployment. There will be lower level jobs which are overtaken by these guys who are not doing currently. Yeah. And the third is newer forms of employment would come into picture. 
So you have, in all in all you have an increased aggregate demand. There will be a potential for adding newer services and newer products because you are getting a different talent altogether. Native workers and professionals could migrate to these new forms and there could possibly be an increased wage rate. As was seen in the US, where wages increased from 6.6% to 9.9% based on the migrants that entered US from 1990-2007. The social and political impact. You would have altered social demographics simply because the white population in Europe currently is not procreating whereas the Asians going in are procreating thereby altering the entire demographic picture or the demographic map of the European nations. Altered culture. With the influx of migrants, there are new cultural angles that come into picture, new religious beliefs and slowly but surely their culture would take over until and unless the host nation and their population decide to procreate further. It could result in an altered political environment. You may still have the host nation's political parties ruling the roost. But with the number of people increasing in terms of their migrants, they could obviously alter the political environment by demanding certain aspects for themselves, overlooking the, uh, the host nation's people. Rising intolerance, which is what we are already seeing in Europe, uh, Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister of Hungary, uh, recently, about a couple of weeks ago, said that migrants are allowed to enter Hungary as long as they are Christian. Uh, and he made a statement saying that, I am not against the Muslims, but I have been elected to look after my country and protect its sovereignty. I cannot take a risk of having ISIS militants come into my country. So that was what he said. And also political parties in United Kingdom, like the UK Independent Party, in, in uh, Germany you have the alternative for Deutschland, and in France you have the Nationalist Party, which is very rightist, and they are constantly attacking the migrants coming in. And uh, yesterday in the newspaper you had the chief of the German police saying that, there is intolerance among the nation's population towards migrants, so it could result in a law and order situation in most of Germany. Also, we saw two people arrested yesterday in Germany who were suspect ISIS militants among the migrants. So, uh, so we are having issues in terms of actually trying to figure out who is a genuine migrant and who is not. So, we look at Lebanon which has had a host of migrants entering from almost the entire Middle East over the last decade or so. So you had people going from Palestine, you had people going from Iraq, Iran moving into Lebanon. One out of ten residents in Lebanon is a migrant. Yeah. Uh, demand for electricity has jumped 27% in the last one and a half years and Lebanon does not have adequate electricity to provide. Their energy minister went ahead and made a statement that this is the biggest uh, biggest disaster Lebanon has ever faced in its existence. The influx of Syrian immigrants has costed them 2.6 billion as per the World Bank. Jordan. Jordan also had a huge influx of immigrants over the years, uh, special, specifically from uh, the Palestinian region. Uh, the IMF says that their overall microeconomic impact has been disastrous and negative. The annual growth rate over the years has reduced the latest peak by a percentage point. There has been a rise of a parallel economy in Jordan. Home prices and imports have, uh, have become costlier, exports have fallen and there has been a huge increase in their inflation. But on the other side there are nations who have benefited from migrants. The one being Sweden. Sweden adopted a policy to accept migrants since 1970 because they realized in the 1970s that their population is not growing so they invited people to come and migrate to Sweden. They have 25 times more immigrants than the United States of America. So you can just imagine the numbers that we are talking about. Uh, 
they are one of the richest countries in the world, declining unemployment numbers, and they have an expansive social security measure where everybody is provided free education and free healthcare. No matter what your problem is, the most complicated illness is also provided free by the government. Then you have the United Kingdom, which had a had a huge influx of migrants between 2001 and 2011, primarily because of all the instability in the Balkan region. Uh, the immigrants contributed 20 billion to public finances in this period. The taxes that they paid were 64 percent more than the benefits provided to them by the government of the United Kingdom. They provided skills to the UK that would have cost them 6.8 billion euros in terms of education. Not just this, Germany as well in the 1950s saw a huge influx of Canadian uh, inhabitants moving to the Germany. And they provided an added advantage to the economy because they brought in skills that Germany had never seen. The same thing happened during the Balkans. Germany also had a good had a good innings, so to say, with the Balkan immigrants and they got into the system and Germany flourished. Two more examples that I can think of is France won the World Cup in 1998 with a team full of immigrants, mainly from Africa. And Germany last year, again, their team was full of immigrants, hardly any Germans which won the World Cup. So there are nations that have done exceedingly well with the migrant population and there are nations that did not do well. While I was going through all this data, I realized that the countries that had strong economies thrived with migrant population, whereas countries with shaky economies usually went down faster. So there are certain countries in Europe who are right to say that they cannot afford migrants. So a country like Germany, uh, sorry, a country like Greece, a country like uh, Hungary, a country like Italy could probably collapse because of the migrants coming in. Right? So, the jury on this is out. I mean, the, the data points to economies which can sustain thriving and economies that are not thriving cannot sustain. Yeah? I'd like to conclude with running a video. Okay? It's, it's a video uh, from the last week by John Oliver. Okay? He did a good segment on the entire migrant crisis. I thought I'd share that with you, uh, and then I'm going to. Yo, you know, that thing Belgium is in. <laughs> if, if you've watched the news at all lately, you cannot admit what has been happening there. Europe's migrant crisis is getting worse by the day. A migrant crisis spiraling out of control. Hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers are risking everything. A human wave washing over Europe's southern shores. Hundreds of thousands of migrants have screamed into Europe. The largest influx there since the end of World War II. Wow, the largest since the end of World War II. And remember, millions of people back then were searching both for a better life and for the booth where it was rumored you could slap dead Hitler. <laughs> And look, the scale of this story can be hard to get your head around. Hundreds of thousands of people are on the move just within Europe, and another four million are being posted in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. And when numbers get that high, they can be hard to comprehend. It's like when someone tells you the size of the audience of NCIS New Orleans. 17 million people? How's that even possible? How many Navy-based crimes could there possibly be in New Orleans? This doesn't make any sense. And when you are dealing with a mass of people that large, you really want to be a little careful with how you describe them. Unfortunately, David Cameron, noted alleged swine fellatio enthusiast, <laughs> recently referred to a swarm of people coming across the Mediterranean. And that language matters, because a swarm of anything sounds terrifying, no matter what it is. If I hear there are a lot of kittens coming my way, I'm going to be delighted. But if I hear there is a swarm of kittens approaching, Shotgun, and I'm getting to high ground because I'm not going to let those phony fuckers take me alive. And here, and, and here in the US, some in the media have chosen to reduce the migrant population to one simple stereotype. A new video surfaces online showing why some are worried Europe is opening its doors to potential terrorists. <laughs> Those are reports.
reportedly Muslim refugees on a train in Europe chanting Allah Akbar or God is great. Now, to be clear, we're not saying that any of those people are terrorists or in any way affiliated with a terror group, but it does highlight just how many of these refugees who are fleeing violence in Iraq and Syria are Muslim. Okay. Okay. First, you don't get to claim that you're not calling those people terrorists when your lower third says terrorists invalid, question mark. If you're really not saying they're terrorists, maybe change that to something more accurate like people take train or some wear hats, others less so. And second, describing that as a new video that sheds light on the migrant crisis is a little misleading because in researching this story, we found a version of that same video uploaded onto YouTube back in 2010, well before this migrant crisis even began. And if you are going to use misleading old footage to try and make people frightened of Muslims, why stop there? Just go the whole way and use a clip from True Lights. Now, to be clear, we're not saying that any of those people are terrorists or in any way affiliated with a terror group, but it does highlight just how many of these refugees who are fleeing violence in Iraq and Syria are Muslim. That's, that's only about 10% more racist than what you did. So look, let's just take a step back, because for the record, these people are coming from many different countries and fleeing everything from civil war to economic stagnation. And while each story is unique, many of them are heartbreaking. Rajin is 16 and from Kobane in Syria. Disabled from birth, she cannot walk and made the dangerous crossing from Turkey last week. I've been trying many things for, for the first time during this journey, like a train and a ship. Uh, so uh, I, I just enjoyed it. And you enjoyed it? Yeah. You're the first person I've met who said that. But to understand why, you must know the world she escaped from. Imagine you were 16 and you were all the first to be checked at any minute. What is your dream? So I have to be an astronaut to go out and see and find the new room. <laughs> yes. So, I want to meet the queen. Yes. Oh, I think that girl absolutely deserves to meet an alien and the queen. <laughs> and also, if she has time, a real human with feelings. But unfortunately, for the gene, and so many like her, Europe has yet to create an effective system to process this influx of people. Every country has a different application process, and some are totally overwhelmed and underfunded. We actually got our hands on a couple of registration forms that were given to refugees upon arrival. This one was handed to a Syrian asylum seeker arriving in Greece on September the 5th. It tells him to return for registration on December the 21st. And that could be a tricky three-month wait, because he's not allowed to work in that time. And yet that is nothing compared to this form given to an Iraqi refugee in Turkey telling him to come back on June 15th of 2017. Which sounds bad before you notice the pink sticky notes added at the bottom clarifying that his actual date will be February 19th, 2020. And that is ridiculous. These people can't go five years without working. They're refugees, not Renee Zellweger. <laughs> and, and facing that kind of limbo, it's no wonder refugees want to try to push deeper into Europe, and many of them are heading for one surprising country in particular that seems to actually want them. They keep coming, thousands every day at the main train station in Munich, often greeted by the local locals or welcome volunteers. It's no wonder that Germany is the preferred destination for so many refugees. That's right, amazingly, one of the warmest welcomes on offer to immigrants comes from Germany. A country whose idea of a bedtime story is two children being left to die in the forest before being nearly cooked to the and then murdering an old woman. Sleep well. Unfortunately, many politicians in other countries than Germany have, have been actively hostile to anyone even considering settling within their borders. No way, the Netherlands are. Please don't come. It's risky to come. We can't guarantee that you will be accepted here. The Danish government has published these ads in a number of Lebanese newspapers. The text is obviously written in Arabic and is telling migrants don't come to Denmark, highlighting the tough regulations and constraints that await them there. That's right. Denmark is so averse to taking people in. It's basically placing intentionally missed connections ads in other countries. 
Me, Turkish government official, you were first in the Lebanese refugee camp. From the moment I saw you, I knew there was nothing between us and it could never work. Perfect send. <laughs> but even Denmark's approach seems friendly. Next to the video apparently produced by the mayor of Ashitala in Hungary, showing exactly how he and his police forces would prevent migrants from coming to his town. Magyarország rossz választás. Ashitala pedig a legrosszabb. Prince Harry's entourage. I didn't want to be world title. I didn't want to be world title. 